Hi everybody, my name is Mitchell Farmer and today we'll be discussing Laboratory 2 of the GI block, the inguinal region. Just to orientate you to the view I have today, basically we have the trilaminar muscles, the internal oblique, which is deep to the external oblique, and then the deepest of the three, the transversus abdominis muscle. Then I've removed half of the hip bones for um, to better visualize the posterior aspect of the external oblique later in the lab. But the hip bones that I do have on the right side of the model, I have the pubis, the ilium, and the ischium. Then there's the spermatic fascia, um, which kind of demonstrates the spermatic cord really in this case. And then the inguinal canal kind of would extend roughly between here and here it's four centimeters long and that's going to be the topic of most of this lab so i'm going to begin with the structure of the inguinal canal which can be difficult to visualize but it's taught in the cadaveric dissection is taught in lecture and i'll be kind of going over it right now so hopefully between those three things you'll have uh, a pretty good idea about it so i'm going to start with the roof of the inguinal canal or the kind of superior wall or superior roof of the inguinal canal which is made up of the overarching fibers of the transversus abdominis and the internal abdominal oblique muscles so you can kind of see that the internal oblique muscles overarch atop this spermatic fascia which is kind of where the inguinal canal would exist and similarly, you can see all the transverse abdominus muscles also overarch. So that would be the roof of the inguinal canal. The next thing I wanted to go over is the anterior wall of the inguinal canal, which is made of the external oblique aponeuroses as well as superficial fascia and skin. So the external oblique aponeuroses on the model's left, I have present, and you can see how they, they being the most superficial of the trilaminar muscles you could see how they would form the anterior aspect of the inguinal canal and in fact if i zoom out a bit and i add the external oblique muscles to the left hand side of the model you can see how it covers over top of what was once visible so if i fade it you can see the spermatic fascia in the background there and how this is anterior to it and thus forms the anterior wall of it and then for the floor or kind of the inferior aspect of the inguinal canal, there is the inguinal ligament, which is seen here. And the inguinal ligament is kind of shown to be um, a separate structure to the external obliques. But in reality, what it is, is, is the interned edge of the external oblique aponeuroses. So as the external obliques come down and turn inward across like this, they form the inguinal ligament, which exists between the acis of the ilium and the pub pubic tubercle. Finally, I wanted to discuss the posterior wall of the in inguinal canal. The posterior wall is difficult to show because the model doesn't have transversalis fascia present, um, which would form the lateral aspect of the posterior wall. However, what you can see quite well is medially the posterior wall is formed by the conjoined tendon. The conjoined tendon is a medial fusion of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscle fibers. So if I kind of zoom in here, you can see the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, both of which are posterior to the spermatic fascia, which would be within the inguinal canal at this point. And this area here would be the conjoined tendon which would be both of these fibers contributing to it and forming the medial posterior wall of the inguinal ligament. Also, um, in part, the um, posterior wall is also in part formed by the reflected ing inguinal ligament medially as well, to some extent. Now, as the testes descend from the posterior abdominal wall into the um, scrotum, they t carry along pieces or t tissue from the anterior abdominal wall, and they also make kind of a hiatus and a dimple in the anterior abdominal wall. 
the hiatus is the superficial ring kind of where the exits so to speak the abdominal wall um through the external oblique except it can't really be said to be exiting because they're bringing along layers of the abdominal wall but essentially the superficial ring is approximately here and in the cadaveric dissection it can be found above and lateral to the pubic crest and pubic tubercle just to show you really quickly where the pubic crest and pubic tubercle is i will take you into a multicolor mode of the pubis orientate you so we're looking anteriorly and this is the pubic tubercle and this is the pubic crest so if we exit here that would be approximately here and here so superior and lateral to that you would find the superficial ring formed by the oblique aponeuroses or a hiatus in the oblique aponeuroses the deep ring is difficult for me to show you because it's a dimple in the transversalis fascia which is not present but is the deepest fascial layer of the anterior abdominal wall and the deep ring exists at the midpoint between the acis and the pubic tubercle. If you recall, this is the acis of the ileum. And this is the pubic tubercle. So at that midpoint, approximately here, there would be a dimple in the transversalis fascia, um, which would be the deep inguinal ring. So moving on to the actual contents of the inguinal canal, there is the spermatic cord. Um, which is kind of roughly represented by the spermatic fascia here. Basically, the spermatic cord is made out of three layers of the anterior abdominal wall. The transversalis fascia makes the internal spermatic fascia. The internal oblique um, kind of becomes the cremaster muscle, and the external oblique aponeuroses become the external spermatic fascia as the testes descend from the posterior abdominal wall into the scrotum. Within these layers, which are now known to be the spermatic cord, is four structures. There is the vas deferens, and the four structures are shown on the left-hand side of the model here. And I can fade this, and you can see them within there as well. But on the left-hand side of the model, there's the vas deferens, um, which can kind of carry sperm towards the prostate. Then there is the testicular artery, the testicular... Um, veins or the pampiniform plexus as well as the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve now the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve arises from the l1 and l2 vertebrae and passes through the deep inguinal ring to enter the inguinal canal in males it supplies the cremaster muscle and the anterior scrotal skin then the other nerve that passes through the inguinal canal is the ilioinguinal nerve and it enters the inguinal canal midway and exits the superficial ring lateral and superficial to the spermatic cord so you can see that it's definitely lateral and superficial to the spermatic fascia here as stated where kind of roughly where the superficial ring would be it branches off to supply the skin of the upper and medial aspects of the thigh as well as the anterior aspect of the scrotum I don't have those branches in right now, um, but we will be reviewing them later in Repro and MSK, so we'll cover them then. And I guess just a note about the genital branch, as well as the ilioinguinal nerve, um, is that since both nerves arrive from L1, they contribute in the male to the cremasteric reflex, with the ilioinguinal nerve as the sensory component, that nerve that's outside the spermatic fascia, whereas the genital branch is the motor component of that reflex. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is that in females, the obviously there is no spermatic cord. And instead, there is the round ligament of the uterus, which travels through the inguinal canal. And in females, the ilioinguinal nerve supplies the skin of the upper and medial aspect of the thigh, along with the anterior aspect of the labius majoris. Now, the reason that all of this is important is because um, structures can herniate through the canal or in structures anatomically related to or close to an, anatomically related to the canal. So there's two types of hernias or two broad hernia categories. There's indirect and direct hernias. Now in the case of indirect hernias, you often get bowel structures like the small intestine or greater omentum 
herniating from the abdomen into the deep inguinal ring, inguinal canal, and sometimes out of the superficial inguinal ring to end up in the scrotum adjacent to the testes but outside the spermatic cord. So it would come in through the inguinal ring, through the inguinal canal, and it could actually enter the testes. And this is known as the indirect path. But since the structures that are herniating have to go through those layers of the abdominal wall the same as how the spermatic cord did, you will have the same layers as the spermatic cord present around the said structures, that being the transversalis fascia, deep, the internal oblique, and the external oblique superficially. Now, the indirect inguinal hernia involves the deep ring, and the structures involved, the small bowel for example, will always be lateral to the inferior epigastric ves vessels, if you recall that vein which exists on the posterior aspect um, of like the inferior side of the rectus abdominis muscle as they engage the inguinal canal. So as contents engage the inguinal canal, they will be lateral to those to that inferior epigastric vein. And that's one of the ways to distinguish between whether the hernia is a direct hernia or indirect hernia. Because if the contents are engaged in the inguinal canal medial, to the inferior epigastric vessels, then it is a direct hernia. And what most often happens with the direct hernia is the contents herniate through the location of Hasselbeck's triangle, um, which I will now review. So I'm just going to get rid of the external oblique on the model's left, as well as the internal oblique. and the transversus abdominis. So basically I've gotten rid of the trilaminar muscles in order to reveal the rectus abdominis and underlying structures. Now Hasselbeck's triangle, the boundaries are laterally, there is the inferior epigastric vessels. Inferiorly, there is the inguinal ligament and medially, there is the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis. And this forms Hasselbach's triangle. And this is also roughly the site of the conjoined tendon, which is where you will see the herniation. So that's why if there is a herniation medial to the inferior epigastic vessels through Hasselbach's triangle, this is what's known as the direct route for a hernia or a direct hernia. Finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the testes. So the testes aren't really well shown in this model, but basically there's the tunica vaginalis, not present here, but reviewed in Dr. Lemlin's lecture, so check that out. And that's formed forms a parietal and visceral layers, layer for, worth noting. But what is worth seeing, or what can be seen here, is the epididym, epididymis, which is superior and lateral to the testes. Really, um, that's all that we can see really well. I'll review it a bit more in repro block, but the testes aren't really that complicated in this model, unfortunately. So yeah, that's basically everything I have to review in this video. I look forward to seeing you in laboratory three of GI.